project. Uh, his computer crashed last week, and so uh, we haven't been able to update our website yet again. Um, so if you're interested in finding the recorded sessions, they are located uh, on this website, the youtube.com, and then slash user slash UW co-op extension. And when you go to that website, if you scroll down and click on this right here, Environment and Natural Resources, it will take you to the listing of all the videos. And uh, the introduction to timber harvesting was just posted yesterday, so that one is available now. Again, uh, our regular website is woodlandinfo.org, and if you scroll down to learn about your land series, all the classes are listed there, including that internet series where a link to those videos will be posted, hopefully by the end of this week. Uh, this is also a good place to follow up in case you're interested in classes in the future. This is where all classes will be posted from now on. So worth remembering this website, again, woodlandinfo.org. And one other website I wanted to share with you tonight um, is the DNR Forest Health website. And that web, uh, web address is at the top of the screen, dnr.state dot wi dot us slash forestry slash fh for forest health. Uh, on this, uh, the reason I'm sharing this with you today is that we do have um, Linda Williams on with us as a speaker, um, but I did want to show you where you can find uh, the other forest health spe specialists in the state. So on the left side of the screen here, there is a link for staff. And if you click on that, you will get a map of the state, and it shows the five DNR regions within the state. And if you find the county where your forest land is located, that will indicate who your regional specialist is. So uh, I'm going to scroll down here. And uh, Linda has the eastern part of the northeastern part of the state, the pink shaded area. Uh, some of you may have land in West Central, that would be Marathon, Portage, and Wood Counties, um, and that is Todd Lanigan. And then there are a few counties represented up here in the blue um, section, and most likely that's going to be Brian Schwingle, but Brian Schwingle and Shane Weber both share that northern area, the northern region. So if you're interested in contact information, that's where you find that contact information. And with that, I'm going to pass this pass the speaking on to Linda, who is a, as I mentioned, a forest health specialist with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. And I will let uh, Linda give you a little background on herself. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, tonight, I did want to talk about some of the different insects and diseases that people are seeing in their forests. Um, some of the more common ones or some of the ones that we've just simply been seeing recently. I post my, uh, my contact information here. I will also have it up at the end of the presentation. Uh, email address there as well as my phone number. Um, as Chris said, I am a forest health specialist with the Department of Natural Resources and I work in the Northeast region, which is a, a 16 county region. Um, and we do have other forest health specialists that handle some of the other regions. Um, so you can certainly contact any one of us to ask general questions um, and then contact the person working in your specific region if you need a site visit uh, for anything in particular. All right, well, let's get started with some of the insect and disease uh, issues out there. But before we do that, I want you to think about the overall health of your forest and some of the, um, some of the stresses that affect it. This particular graphic is a drought severity index graphic. And it goes back to about 1895 on the left, far left-hand side, here's on the far right-hand side. Anything that's in red is a dry, droughty year. Anything that's in green is a more moist year. So if you look over on the right-hand side, you'll see that 2003 was um, actually quite a droughty year. It was pretty much droughty the whole, uh, the whole season, spring, summer, fall. Um, in 2005, we had a summer drought. 
In 2006 and 2007, we had short summer droughts, usually just two or three months where it was very dry. And then in 2008, um, the fall in some areas, in many areas of the state, was very, very dry. Um, so with trees, trees do not recover instantaneously from a stress like drought or a stress like flooding. It takes them a little while to recover. And if they haven't recovered yet, by the time the next stress, perhaps the next drought, comes along, then those stresses just become additive and you get stresses piling up on stresses and causing significant um, uh, total stress for the tree. Now there are some insects and diseases that will take advantage of trees that are under stress and I'll talk a little about both of them. So let's start with the diseases. One of the uh, most common diseases that will take advantage of trees under stress, and that's uh, trees from any stress, whether it's drought or, or flooding or maybe you've been driving over the roots or, or some other reason. Malaria root rot is a fungus that we find um, able to attack these stressed trees. Now our malaria root rot resides in the soil. It's pretty much everywhere in the state, but it just kind of hangs out there until the trees are under enough stress that that fungus can start to attack the roots. It starts to attack the roots. It, it, it moves in towards the tree. As it continues, it rots the roots, and eventually the tree has no roots left. And of course, trees can't live without their roots. Um, an additional stress that plays a part in this, um, if you have young plantations, Poorly planted trees can struggle through for a while, um, you know, and survive quite nicely until a few of the stresses add up. And poor planting is a stress. Um, we started to see the consecutive summers of droughtiness catching up to some of these poorly planted trees. Now, if you want to know whether this particular tree has died from our malaria, you peel the bark right at the base of the tree, right, at, right near ground level. And underneath that bark, if you see a, a white substance, that would be our malaria. And by the time it reaches um, the, the tree, the roots are so rotten, they're, they're virtually um, useless to the tree. Normally, if this was a healthy tree, you would be seeing kind of a nice tan color of wood under here. But we see this white stuff underneath. That's a sign of our malaria. Now, some of the poor, pl poor planting practices that we see, uh, on the right-hand side, this is J-rooting. Um, the, the trees are kind of swept down into the slit in the ground as they're planted. The roots are all shoved off to one side. And these trees can actually persist for quite a number of years. The tree on the right was a six-year-old tree and uh, finally comes to multiple stresses, including J-rooting. Um, on the left, you see roots that were twisted together, and what happened here is the tree was stuck down into the slit, the planting slit in the ground. Some of the roots were still sticking out, so they gave it a twist to wrap those roots and pop those roots down into the planting slit, and um, you end up with uh, twisted roots, and this does create a pretty significant stress on the tree. Again, this tree survived for a number of years. This tree was a four-year-old tree before it died. Um, armillary root rot does attack all sizes of trees, um, from the, the new seedlings up to saplings up to mature trees. But it, it creates the same symptoms on all of them. On the left-hand side is a mature oak. On the right-hand side is a mature cedar. And you can see we've peeled the bark, and underneath is this white substance. Um, and that's the armillaria that you would be looking for. If you look closer, you can see that it is a kind of a filamentous uh, fungi growing up underneath the bark, but it, it still just gives that white cast. Um, the armillaria fungus does have an external fruiting mushroom. It's called a honey mushroom, and for those of you who uh, are into edible mushrooms, you'll know that the honey mushroom is... Now one of the really cool things about armillaria, because there are cool things about uh, root rotting fungi, but our malaria actually glows, or more specifically, I should say it's bioluminescent. Um, it glows like this. We don't call it our malaria because that's not very cool. We call it fairy fire or fox fire. And I get this reported a lot of times from hunters or fishermen who are out after dark, uh, maybe walking up um, from hunting or fishing, and they will see 
rotting stumps, uh, maybe stumps uh, or a tree that's tipped up out of the ground and so the rotting roots are exposed and they will see this glowing on those rotting stumps or the, the exposed roots. So that's really kind of cool about our malaria. But otherwise, it, it is a, a fungus that can attack our trees when they are under stress. Now another disease that we started to see a lot of this last summer is Diplodia. Diplodia affects uh, red pine primarily, but it'll also affect our other pines. And in this picture, you can see that um, some of the large pines are quite heavily affected. It is, which means it just kind of hangs out for a long time, waiting for just the right conditions. Um, trees under stress constitute just the right conditions. Now, when um, when the Diplodia is in the overstory, if you've got a few branches that have died from Diplodia, that's usually okay. A mature overstory tree can usually handle that. Unfortunately, the lower, uh, the, the understory trees will get the same symptoms, but sometimes they don't handle it as well. The symptoms are usually this branch tip death between, usually between 8 to 10 inches of the branch tip dies. Sometimes a, a foot or more can die though. And again, on a mature tree, if there's you know a half dozen branch tips that die, no big deal. But if a half dozen branch tips died on this tree, that would be every branch tip this poor little tree owns. So it can be really hard on understory red pine um, when diplodia is affecting them. And again, it just kind of waits until the trees are under stress and then it's able to attack them. Now another interesting um, aspect of diplodia is that not only does it cause branch tips to die, it can also cause cankers on the main stem. The tree on the left, you can see that the top of the tree is dead. Um, this was a plantation of red pine. Um, I believe this was a 10-year-old plantation. And when I walked up to this tree on the left, I could see dried resinous uh, blobs on the stem. I peeled that area and underneath I could see a canker. This, this brown area that you see is the canker and a canker just means it's a dead section of the tree. Once that, once that dead section wraps all the way around the tree, um, the top of the tree turtled and the top dies. So that is one of the um, ways that we see Diplodia affecting uh, sapling sized red pine as well. Unfortunately, Diplodia can also affect seedling sized red pine. Um, this was a picture taken this last summer and usually when Diplodia attacks these young trees, it attacks them right at the base and we call that a basal canker and it grows around the base, girdles the tree and the whole seedling dies. Um, so it can be on a whole uh, range of sizes of red pine and you can get several different symptoms of diplodia. So what can you do about diplodia if you have it? Unfortunately, those symptoms that I was just showing you, it's probably too late to do anything about those particular trees. Um, if you have mature trees with less than 30% crown dieback, they should ring. If you have more than 30% crown dieback, that's going to put the tree under additional stress. So not only was it under stress from who knows what, maybe several summers of drought, um, but now it's been attacked by Diplodia. Some of the branch tips have been killed, so that's an additional stress. And with that additional stress, sometimes that allows insects and diseases to come in and attack those trees that, and can kill the trees. Um, the insects would usually be bark beetles. The disease would usually be armillaria root rot coming in to those trees under stress. We do recommend trying to keep trees healthy, which will us, and then consequently, consequently minimize the amount of Diplodia that you get in your stand. And plant trees plant trees properly. Um, if you plant a tree properly, then that's just one less stress that that tree has to deal with. And I threw this one in. This one's pretty realized, but if you can avoid hailstorms in your plantation, by all means do. Um, one thing that we've noticed is that uh, when hailstorms pass over um, plantations of red pine, even if it's small hail, they will create small damaged spots on the fine branches up in the crown and those tiny little wounds will allow Diplodia to get in more easily to the tree. And we can commonly see exactly where hailstorms went 
when they cross over plantations because it's those strips that have a lot of diplodia. Now there are some insects that do really well during years when it's droughty. There are some insects that of trees that are under stress from drought, but there are also insects that just do very well when it's, when it's droughty. One of the reasons that insects do well when it's dry is there's a fungal pathogen that is able to grow on insects and kill insects when there's enough moisture. So in those dry years, there's not enough moisture for that fungus to grow, and so all of the insects survive. So one of the insect pests that we've seen uh, building up their populations over the last couple of dry summers is pine root collar weevil. Um, primarily this is going to attack our pines and usually we don't have pines like red, white, or jack pine, um, but this year we started seeing it. Uh, the picture here is of a red pine. And what happens is this insect bores at the very base of the tree and you may get trees tipping over even when the tree is still green. Um, this tree is a little bit off color but the tree has just completely tipped over. Uh, this particular insect does find it easier to attack trees under drought stress. So if you've got several consecutive dry summers, uh, this insect will probably do quite well. Um, if, you sus if you have trees that have tipped over and you suspect collar weevil, check the very base of the tree. And what you may see, if it is pine root collar weevil, is the base of the tree is going to be a dark black color. Um, there will probably be dried pitch and dried resin at the very base. Also the soil, whoops, sorry about that. Also the soil at the very base of the tree will also be black and have a lot of dried pitch in it. It'll be kind of crystallized. Uh, this is the insect over on the right hand side. This is the larvae that does the damage underneath the bark. And the adult is a beetle, but the adult lays the eggs. The larvae bore underneath the bark, and then they bore around under the bark, feeding in the cambium layer. The cambium layer just under the bark is the area where food and water is moved. So this insect feeds in that area, basically girdles the tree, and creates a weak spot right here at the base, which allows the tree to tip over then, and usually kills the tree. It does prefer scotch pine and Austrian pine, but it can attack our native pines, especially if they're under stress. So how can you control pine root collar weevil? Well, there's basically two options. Um, you can try and we have fewer options of insecticides now than we did in previous years. The really good stuff that worked really well was really bad for for us, and uh, it's no longer available. It's been taken off the market. But there are some options out there. They do tend to change a little bit every year, so check with your forest health specialist or your um, forester to find out what the latest uh, chemicals are that you can use. But you have to treat around the entire circumference of each tree at ground level. So it is kind of labor intensive. You can also um, use uh, non-pesticide uh, non options. You can prune up the lower branches and pull the needles and duff and weeds back from the very base of the tree. What these two things do together is they allow wind to go under the tree and dry out the base of the tree more. They also allow more sunlight to get into the base of the tree. Again, to dry out the base of the tree. If the base of this tree is more dry, you will probably not have any pine root collar weevil because it prefers that slightly moist, protected environment. Um, so again, this is a fairly labor intensive option, but um, you know, it's, it's the non-chemical option if you prefer um, to go without chemicals. Now another insect that we've been seeing just in, in incredible population explosions in are all of our saw flies. Um, the two that I've shown here um, primarily defoliate our pines, primarily young pines even. Typically pines that are 10 feet tall or shorter can be defoliated by these two sawflies. On the left, pine sawfly, and this one is, even though it's in, an introduced exotic species, um, this is probably the better of the two. Um, the Sawfly larvae only feed on the old foliage. So if your tree has been defoliated by European pine sawfly, they may eat all of the old foliage, but there will be new foliage 
growing, and the tree will certainly survive, even though it may look like kind of a Charlie Brown tree for a while. On the right-hand side is our native sawfly, the red-headed pine sawfly. And unfortunately, this sawfly starts by feeding on the older needles, but then it can move and feed on the current year needles. And in a single season, red-headed pine sawfly can completely defoliate a young tree. And red pine just does not handle defoliation very well. And after a single season of defoliation, like you see on the right-hand side, uh, you can start to see mortality in those young pines. Now, we did see large numbers of almost every other sawfly that we have out there. And some of these sawflies I rarely see. Um, you know, I, I have to stumble upon them to find them at all. But in the past year or two, these sawfly populations have, have really grown. Um, we have sawflies that um, feed on cedar and some of our other pines and spruce. We also have a number of sawflies that feed on our hardwood trees. On the lower left, you can see black-headed ash sawfly. And in the lower right, you can see elm sawfly. The elm sawfly is one of our biggest sawflies. Um, it's about the size of your average pinky finger. Um, and it has a disturbing habit of when you walk under the tree that it's feeding on, and it tends to feed on elm and willow, when you walk under the tree it's feeding on, it drops out of the tree and often hits you. Um, people don't really appreciate insects dropping out of the trees onto them, especially when they're hit with a fairly good-sized caterpillar. Now, there are some options for sawfly control. You decide, but if you choose to use a pesticide, you have to use a general insecticide, one that can kill a wide range of insects. These particular caterpillars, even though they look like your, your average caterpillar, these are a sawfly. They're different than a regular caterpillar. And BT, which is that specialized insecticide specifically for caterpillars, won't work on sawflies. So you have to use a general insecticide. Um, it, for sawflies that feed in a colony, because in a group, and once they've then eaten all the needles or all of the leaves in that area, they will move as a group to another area, and then they will feed in that area. It is a defense mechanism. It looks scary when they're all feeding in a group. They look like a big, nasty something or other, and predators are scared away. Um, so there is a, a reason for feeding as a group. You can spray with a pesticide. If you can find these colonies, it's very easy then to spray just that colony. You could spray with soapy water. Now, soapy water will take some time to work. Um, soapy water breaks down the cuticle on the insect's body, and the insect basically dehydrates to death. Uh, so that'll take a day or two, usually. Um, so if you're looking for something that you can spray on these um, sawflies, and they will fall to the ground writhing and die, don't use soapy water. You'll want to use some kind of pesticide. You also have the uh, kind of interesting option of squishing these colony sawflies by hand. I would highly recommend wearing a rubber glove or a leather glove or something like that, but you can just walk up to these colonies and just squish them. Um, so if, if that's what you'd like to do, if that's going to make you feel better killing those insects like that, go for it. Now, populize, as with all of our insects, do go through cycles and they do collapse. Right now happens to be a very high period for most of our soft flies that we have in Wisconsin. But eventually, the populations will collapse. Now, we're transitioning into the regular caterpillars now. So we'll, we'll move away from the sawflies to regular caterpillars. And uh, start with eastern tent caterpillar. This is the one that actually forms a web on the trees. You guys probably see these along the roadsides. Often found on black cherry, but can be found on other species as well. It's not usually a forest pest. If you have black cherry growing in your forest, a lot of times you won't get eastern tent caterpillar out in that black cherry that's growing in your forest. Um, so generally, this is not a forest pest, but people commonly get it mixed up with the forest tent caterpillar. Um, unfortunately, the forest tent caterpillar doesn't make a tent at all, so that's kind of a poor name for that caterpillar. Um, but you can see they look very different. On the left is the forest tent caterpillar, kind of a very pretty blue, actually, with kind of uh, uh, cream-colored dots down its back. On the right-hand side is eastern tent caterpillar, a dark caterpillar with a white line down its back. Now, forest tent caterpillar does actually cause widespread defoliation in our forests, but it's usually only 12 to 
only every 12 to 15 years. Our last outbreak of forest hen caterpillars started in 1999 and ended in 2003. So I don't think we're due for a forest tent caterpillar outbreak for a few years yet. Gypsy moth is one of the other caterpillars that we have in Wisconsin. Um, not everyone in Wisconsin has gypsy moth yet. Not knowing where my audience was going to be coming from, uh, the lower right-hand corner, there's a, a display of the state of Wisconsin. The counties that are in red are considered generally infested with gypsy moth. The counties that are in white, gypsy moth is still either building up for the first time or it's possible they really don't even have much gypsy moth yet, if at all. Um, so depending where your land is, you may have had gypsy moth defoliation or you may not. Um, but it is marching steadily westward across the state. And as it goes, it, it defoliates quite a number of different species of trees. Oak and aspen are its favorite trees to defoliate. And if you look down um, towards the bottom, 2007 was a big year. We had 23,000 acres of defoliation across Wisconsin. In 2008, the number dropped. Uh, the number of defoliated acres was only 8,500 8, acres. And this was primarily because uh, even though we had a dry fall in 2008, the spring of 2008 in most areas was fairly moist. And remember I mentioned that, um, that fungus that can attack and kill insects? Well, gypsy moth has one called entomophaga. And when it was that, uh, that moist weather in the spring, entomophaga was able to get rolling and start attacking and killing gypsy moth, which did cause some of the populations to drop or collapse, which then shows up in fewer defoliated acres. This map shows you where gypsy moth has been uh, doing its defoliation, uh, primarily in the, the central part of the state. Uh, but there's a few, uh, well, on the left-hand side, you can see the egg masses. The light tan egg mass is an old egg mass. It looks a little rough. On the left is a uh, darker, solid, more solid looking egg mass. This is a new egg mass. On the bottom here, you see the adult female moth, and she cannot fly. Her sole purpose is to mate, lay eggs, and die. Now, we did have some other insects um, attacking and killing our trees, and we've really seen the numbers building up just in the last couple of years. Now, a lot have heard about emerald ash borer. In fact, in that poll that uh, was done at the start, 68% of you said that, yes, you'd heard of emerald ash borer, which is wonderful. But there are actually other native insects that attack and kill our ash. Uh, one of those that we've seen really build up in some pretty high populations in the last year or two is flat-headed apple tree borer. Even though the name might seem like it only attacks apple trees, um, it does attack ash. It bores underneath the wood. You can see the larvae on the right-hand side. And as the larvae bores under the wood, it creates uh, tunnels under the wood, little galleries. They're kind of um, shapeless, uh, kind of a nebulous blob. And when I show you later the emerald ash borer tunnels, the galleries that you'll see under the bark, um, you'll see a very clear difference between this one and the emerald ash borer. So we have been seeing flat-headed apple tree borer. I've actually seen this uh, killing large mature trees. Um, so I, I wasn't expecting that, but I started to see that this last year. We also have red-headed ash borer, which is actually a longhorned beetle. So even though this photo on the upper right makes it kind of look like a grasshopper with these very large uh, back legs, it is actually a longhorned beetle. The larvae is a, a wood-boring larvae, and it bores deep into the tree, creating tunnels throughout the wood of the tree, in the branches and in the main stem. So this creates structural problems. You get branch breakage, um, and eventually you, you do get tree mortality. One of the other um, kind of strange things that I've been seeing, I didn't expect this insect to respond to you know, droughty, droughty, dry summers, uh, but we have just an amazing amount of spruce gall adelgid. Now, we actually have two different kinds of spruce gall adelgid, one that attacks blue spruce, that's the coolie spruce gall adelgid, one that attacks white spruce, which is the eastern spruce gall adelgid. On the left-hand side, um, you can see eastern spruce gall adelgid, this little pineapple-like thing, is something that the tree grows around the little tiny insects 
to give them shelter. Isn't that nice of the tree? <laughs> Actually, it's due to a reaction with the insect spit. Um, it causes this um, malformation of the needles, and it causes this little pineapple-like thing. As the season con uh, continues on, those galls will dry out, and on the right-hand side you can see the dried galls. They dry out, they crack open, which releases the little tiny insects inside. When the insects are actually living in there, they're sucking the sap of the tree, um, and once they emerge, then they mate and lay eggs and, and uh, complete the life cycle. Um, these galls will stay on the tree for many, many years. And so some trees are just so heavily galled um, that they almost look brown. There are so many brown dead galls on that. The Cooley spruce gall adelgid, which affects blue spruce, instead of being a small, round, pineapple-like structure, it's a much longer uh, pineapple-like structure. And this one is cut in cross-section. And usually these are an inch or sometimes up to two inches long. All of these little pockets that you see along the edge, that's where the little adelgids live. That's where they suck their sap. And then eventually this will dry out, turn brown, and the, the edges will crack open to release these spruce gall adelgids. Now these guys aren't very big, but if you get enough of them on a tree, all of them sucking sap, it camps on the tree. Um, this is a branch you can see the... This is uh, eastern spruce gall adelgid. You can see the gall up at the top center. Um, this is a spruce needle, which spruce needles aren't very big. Um, and if you look, you'll see a little tiny thing on the spruce needle. If you zoom in, that's the adult adelgid. So they're not how big a spruce needle is, and it's barely covering the tip of this spruce needle. These guys aren't very big, but when you get hundreds and thousands of them on a tree, they can still suck a fair amount of sap. So let's take another look at this uh, drought severity index uh, graphic. And the first one that I showed you was a statewide average for Wisconsin. Now I already mentioned that most of the state had a cool, moist spring in 2008. But some areas of the state, for instance, the central area of Wisconsin, and this graphic is specific to that central area, had not only a cool wet spring, but they had a cool wet year. Um, you can see on the right-hand side, um, they're almost up here to the extremely moist category in the central part of Wisconsin. So what does that mean for insects or diseases? Well, what that means when you have not only a cool wet spring plus a wet summer means it's a great year for fungal diseases. On the left hand side, needle rust. This occurred on red pine and uh, what you're looking at, if I can get my mouse here, uh, you're looking at these orange things that are sticking out of the needles. Um, this is the, the rust emerging from the needle and it does kill the needle. Um, we found pine needle rust occurring so heavily in some plantations that the plantation looked brown. It was absolutely amazing. Um, the good news is pine needle rust only attacks the, the previous year's needles. So the tree still has the current year needles, but unfortunately um, red pine does like to hold its needles for two full years before it drops them. So it is going to put the trees under a little bit of stress by killing off those second year needles. We also saw in the upper right hand corner um, anthracnose and tar spot on maple, and I'll talk more about that in just a minute. And we saw powdery mildews. Usually powdery mildews don't cause much damage to trees, but when you get a wet spring and a wet summer, the powdery mildews can actually build up so heavy on the leaf that they can cause that leaf to drop early. We did see aspen being defoliated by two different fungal diseases. Phyllostichta leaf spot and Marcinina leaf spot were causing so much damage to the leaves that the aspen actually dropped its leaves early. And uh, you know that's, that's an indication of a fair amount of stress to the tree when it drops its leaves early. Um, I said I'd get back to the tar spot in a minute. This is mature tar spot. The first picture I showed you was uh, young tar spot. It was just brown spots. When it's mature, it turns into this large black spot on Norway maples, and it turns into smaller black spots on silver maples. Generally, this is just a cosmetic problem, but 
in years that are really good for fungal diseases, you can actually get so much damage to these leaves that they will drop early, which puts the tree under smoke. We also saw anthracnose in almost every species of broadleaf tree that has anthracnose. Um, on the upper left, we saw anthracnose in ash. And one of the, one of the bad things about ash getting anthracnose, early in the spring, ash will get um, these small little infections of anthracnose on each little leaflet. Unfortunately, the tree then purges these leaves. And in some cases, the trees purge almost every leaf they have. The trees do send out a second set of leaves, but this puts the tree under a fair amount of stress, having to use up additional energy to send out a second set of leaves. In the upper right-hand corner, we did see uh, anthracnose in maple. And in the lower right, we saw anthracnose on oak. In some instances, the oak leaves were so deformed um, that uh, the tree had to send out a second set of leaves. So again, that used up some of its energy reserves to send out that second set of leaves. Um, but uh, it needed those second set of leaves because the first set were so deformed by anthracnose. So based on what I've talked about so far, what does this mean for 2009? What might you expect to see in your woods in 2009? Well, so over the last insects and diseases taking advantage of trees under drought stress, multiple years of drought stress. In 2008, we had lots of insects, all kinds of insects. And we had lots of disease in 2008 because we had that cool, moist spring. So the 2009 insect and disease prediction depends a lot on the spring weather patterns. If we have a dry spring, the insects will just go gangbusters because the populations are poised to be very high. Um, so if it's a dry uh, spring, the insect populations will do great. If we have a moist spring, we had so much fungal disease out there this year that um, it's just waiting to come back next year. If we have a moist spring, that will be perfect for fungal diseases. So we'll have to kind of wait and see uh, just what comes about. Oh, but wait, <laughs> the presentation isn't done yet. I did have a couple of uh, things that I wanted to cover that really aren't related to weather and stress at all, but we've been seeing more and more of in our, our Wisconsin forests. And one that I wanted to talk about was a disease called anosum root rot. This primarily affects our pines and spruces in Wisconsin. So if you have pine or spruce uh, and you're doing any harvest, uh, this would be an important um, root to be aware of. Unfortunately, anosum can infect over 200 species of trees, not just conifers, but broadleaf trees as well. It's not that picky. Um, but Primarily in Wisconsin, we are seeing it just in our pines. A little history of anosum. We first found it in 1993. It's not supposed to be here. Um, they have anosum in the southeastern United States. They do have some anosum out west as well. But it's not supposed to be here in Wisconsin. So we first found it in 1993. And, oh shoot, I meant to update this slide. We currently have uh, 18 counties where we know that anosum is present somewhere in the county. This map shows those counties. So if you have property in any of these counties, you know that there is anosum in those counties. So what's the big deal? Well, the big deal with anosum is when you are in doing management in your pine and spruce plantations, and of course we want you in there doing proper management, creating fresh stumps because you're doing a thinning, you're, you're doing a harvesting. The spores from this particular fungus can land on a fresh cut stump, grow into the stump, and start to rot the stump. If I can get my little mouse here. They start to rot the stump. The fungus then grows downward into the roots, starts to rot the roots. In pine and spruce plantations, those trees are all so close together that they are all root grafted together into one large communal root system. So anosum takes advantage of that, grows down into the roots, it grows outward, and eventually comes to a root graft with a neighboring tree, and then it moves into the root system of that tree. And it moves up and eventually will kill that tree as well. Whether that tree is healthy or under stress, anosum doesn't care. It will kill it. Um, so Unfortunately, this is a disease that continues to spread underground once it gets into a stand. Um, anosum 
can remain viable in the soil for decades. This is not an easy disease where you can just cut down the trees and it goes away. That really doesn't work with a nosum. Um, in this particular photo, you can see all of these pockets of mortality in this plantation where a nosum started out, landing a spore landed on a single stump, then spread down through the root systems to neighboring trees and continued to spread outwards, killing the trees as it went. Now, unfortunately, there are no treatments for anosum. There is only prevention. And um, anosum is almost impossible to get rid of one stand. We've tried. We've tried burning it, we've tried burying it, and it just doesn't work. It's still there. Um, clear cutting an infected stand and replanting may or may, may, or may not be a solution. Um, anosum can remain active in the soil for hundreds of years, and here in Wisconsin we've found it attacking not only pine and spruce, but we've also found it on um, cedar that was growing in the understory of a pine plantation and oak that was growing in the understory of a pine plantation. So again, prevention is really the key with anosum. You don't want to get it into your stand and then do something about it. You want to do something about it before you even have it. We do have two on the stumps to prevent spores from growing in, from landing on these stumps and growing in. One product is Sporax. It's a dry granular powder. And you can see this guy back here. He is shaking out a powder onto the stump. This stump in the foreground has already been treated. It's a little bit white with that powder. We also have a, a new option in Wisconsin um, that's a liquid option. It comes as a powder water, and you can spray it on the stumps, and this will also protect the stumps. Now, the bad news is the stumps need to be treated within 24 hours of being cut. So the, the landowner needs to go out uh, each day that the crews are in there cutting, or it needs to be written into the contract that uh, the logger or the consulting forester will do this every day as they're in there. So once again, this is the map showing where Anosum is known to be in Wisconsin. So if you're in these counties, it is definitely important to consider treating those stumps, if you're in there doing a harvest, treating those stumps to prevent Anosum. You can talk to your forest health specialist, or you can talk to um, your forester or consulting forester that you work with for more information. But it's, it's important, especially in these counties, to uh, use the preventative treatment. Now, I wanted to talk about emerald dash borer as well um, to give you a little update on emerald dash borer. Now, again, about 68% of you indicated that you had already heard of emerald dash borer, so that's fabulous. Emerald ash borer is an exotic insect. It was first identified in southeastern, or excuse me, southeastern Michigan down near Detroit in 2002. So we have an emerald ash borer for all that long. Unfortunately, it was found in Wisconsin um, this last summer in, in one location. So we do have it in Wisconsin now. Um, but you can see, based on this map, that it's in quite a number of other states as well. The problem with emerald ash borer is that it attacks all true ash. Whether they're healthy or stressed, it doesn't care. It attacks them all. Now, um, mountain ash is not a true ash, and prickly ash is not a true ash. So it doesn't affect those two. But it affects our true ash, our true ash which are the white ash, green ash, black ash, and depending where you are in Wisconsin, you may also have red ash or blue ash. Now, the life cycle of emerald ash borer, up in the upper right-hand corner, you can see the adults. They're a fabulous metallic green, but they're not very big. Here you see an average-sized adult emerald ash borer on a penny. So the next time you get out a penny, just check out just how big that penny is. These are not very large insects. But they lay their eggs on the bark of ash trees. Those eggs hatch. The tiny little larvae bore under the bark. They feed in the cambium layer where food and water is moved up and down. And this is what the, the uh, on the lower left, this is what the larvae look like as a mature larvae. Um, after it's been feeding for a while, they're about an inch long. Then they pupate, kind of like a, a chrysalis for a butterfly. And eventually they will then turn into uh, an adult. They'll chew their way out of the tree. They'll mate and lay eggs and start the life cycle over again. There are a number of different symptoms that you can look for if a tree is being attacked by emerald ash borer. Because remember, we do have some native insects that will also attack and kill our ash. 
Um, so it could be a native insect that's killing our ash, but it's good to double check and see if it's emerald ash borer. One of the things, sorry about that, in the upper left hand corner is epicormic sprouting. Uh, some people call these water sprouts, and that's the um, sprouts, uh, the branches that you see right along the main stem. So the crown is declining and the tree as a last gasp effort because it knows it's dying, it sends out these epicormic sprouts all along the main stem and sometimes from the very base of the tree. Uh, this is a typical characteristic of trees that are infested with emerald ash borer. When you peel the bark of trees that are infested with emerald ash borer, you'll notice tunnels get Whoops, sorry about that. You'll notice tunnels and galleries underneath the bark, and they wind back and forth. They're very clear tunnels. Um, it's very clear that there was an insect working under here, and they wind back and forth, back and forth. In those areas where you have emerald ash borer boring around underneath the bark, that does cause the cambium layer to die, and it causes the bark to dry out right above that spot. So you'll end up with bark splits. If you see bark splits on an ash tree, walk up and look closer underneath the bark split and see if you can see those larval galleries um, just to the left. You may also see D-shaped exit holes in the lower, uh, lower left-hand corner. The adult insect um, from head on, it's shaped in a capital D, D as in dog, capital D shape, and they chew a hole that is exactly their size to get out of the tree. So the hole that you will see in the tree is a D-shaped hole. Now these are not very big because these insects are not very big. Um, so take a look closer. You'll have to look pretty close sometimes to find these D-shaped exit holes. If you've peeled the bark, you may also find larvae. Or woodpeckers may be looking for the insect for you. Uh, woodpecker damage looks like bark that is just being flaked off. The tree will have kind of a lighter colored appearance. If you notice that on ash trees, uh, go up and take a closer look just to make sure it's not emerald ash borer. This is a street in Michigan uh, with uh, large, lovely ash trees. And that was pre-emerald ash borer. And this is after emerald ash borer. Um, emerald ash borer attacks all trees larger than one inch in diameter. It's not real picky about the size of tree. And as I said earlier, it can attack perfectly healthy trees. It also attacks trees in our woodlots. It will find every ash that's out there. Uh, this is a picture actually from Wisconsin. Uh, the, the dead trees, the kind of grayish looking trees, are the ash trees in this particular stand, and they are dead. Now there's quite a number of insects that are green in Wisconsin, and these are very commonly mistaken for emerald ash borer. If you find a green insect and you're not sure if it's emerald ash borer or not, um, you can either send the insect to a forest health specialist, you can uh, take a picture and send the digital picture to a forest health specialist, but we want to know if you think you've found emerald ash borer because we don't want to miss, so if you think you found emerald ash borer, again, it's on the left hand side, it's not very long, it's just barely a half inch long. Um, and some of our other greenish beetles are much larger. But if you're not sure what you're looking at, by all means, send it to us or send us a picture, we'll take a look at it. Now Wisconsin does have a quarantine established in the area where emerald ash borer was found. Emerald ash borer was found right on the border of Washington and Ozaukee counties. And so both of those counties were quarantined. Additionally, Sheboygan and Fond du Lac were relatively close to this location, and so those two counties were quarantined as well. So some of the questions that I commonly get asked is, what should a homeowner or landowner do if emerald ash borer is close to them? Should they be doing anything if emerald ash borer is not close to them? And how close is close? Well, emerald ash borer is going to affect homeowners. Some of the questions that homeowners have to ask themselves, are you going to lose all of your yard trees and all of your shade? Do you have small trees or just, uh, or just mature trees? Are you going to have to run? Mm. Will you have to remove, or how will you remove the dead? Are you going to pay a tree care company, which can get kind of pricey? Will you remove them yourself? Always an option. Or will you let them fall down on your own? And your, main, your neighbor may not appreciate that if it falls onto their property. 
You have to ask if you're going to treat your trees with an insecticide. If you choose to do this, you will have to do it every single year for the life of that tree, or for however long you choose to keep that tree alive. Now, there are a number of different insecticide options for treating ash trees. And you should consider treating your trees if you're within 10 to 12 miles of the actual infestation. If you're further out than that, you're kind of wasting your money. Now, if you think that's a good use of your money to treat your trees before emerald ash borer is anywhere near you, that's fine. That's definitely your choice. But we don't recommend um, or make the suggestion that people consider treating until emerald ash borer is within 10 to 12 miles of their ash trees. Now, no insecticides are 100% effective in preventing or eliminating emerald ash borer. And treatment is going to have to be done every single year or every two years, depending on your chemical, for the life of the tree. Unfortunately, insecticide treatment is not practical for woodlots. So what can you do on a woodlot? We have a document, the, and it's available online. You can see the address, the web address, at the bottom of your screen. Um, and it's available on the Forest Health web page that Chris pointed out um, at the start of the presentation. It's called Wisconsin's Forests for the Emerald Ash Borer. It'll ask you a number of questions like how much ash do you have, um, and then it will walk you through some different options that you may have, and it will give you ideas for what you can do. None of these ideas are going to tell you to race in and cut out all the ash right away. Um, we do want people to use uh, good forest management uh, practices and harvest at the proper times, even if emerald ash borer is on the way. Now, the good news is time is on your side in these woodlots. Um, you know, start preparing now because emerald ash borer will get to you eventually, but so far we've only found it in one spot in Wisconsin. Determine how much ash you have on your property, and then think about uh, if every single one of those ash trees died or was harvested, would your intended use of the property be affected? Or would your property goals be affected? Um, if so, you may want to either change your goals or, or do some additional forest management before emerald flash borer gets here. Continue long-term management at good forestry practices. If you have a regularly scheduled harvest coming up, you can favor speech, which means leaving some of those species, and taking out a few more of the ash. Now again, don't take out too many. We're not recommending that, that people slaughter their woodlots uh, or high grade their woodlots. Uh, do a proper harvest, but you can take out a little more ash if you do have an upcoming harvest and want to uh, move some of that ash out and promote some of the other species. We don't really recommend that you ash. Um, it, it does have other benefits. And you never know. We might come up with something that can be sprayed from an air airplane that will protect our woodlots. Um, there's nothing yet, but you never know. And if you're going to keep ash, keep the most vigorous ash. Healthier ash take longer to die when they're attacked by emerald ash borer than a tree that's under stress. So aren't there any other options for woodland owners? I mean, gosh, everyone always says, well, that doesn't sound like I can do very much. Well, pesticides do continue to be evaluated. Genetic resistance is being looked at, but it has any of our native ash. It has been found, uh, genetic resistance has been found in Manchurian ash and Korean ash. The Forest Service is working on trying to breed that into um, our native ash. The Forest Service has collected seed in the um, possible event that all ash is eliminated from the United States, which would take hundreds of years, I'm sure, but then they could reintroduce ash. So they have collected seed, and biocontrol options are being studied and released. Now this is a really cool option. Um, the biocontrol uh, in Michigan, they've been looking at biocontrol that is occurring from native biocontrol insects. All of these that you see here are parasitic wasps. They are non-stinging wasps. They lay their, lay their egg on the emerald ash borer larvae. The egg hatches and eats the emerald ash borer larvae, which is really pretty cool. Um, and these little insects that you see here are parasitic wasps, and they lay their emerald ash borer eggs. The wasp egg hatches, bores into the emerald ash borer egg, and eats the egg. 
In Michigan, they also found an egg parasitoid um, that they really have no idea where it's attacking emerald ash borer, so we love it. In 2003 and 2004, the U.S. Forest Service went over to China to look for um, parasitoid they could bring back that would uh, attack only emerald ash borer. They did find three, the two that you see here and this one were all tested extensively to make sure that they will attack only emerald ash borer. They were then released in 2007 and additional releases were done in 2008. Now on this biocontrol option, at least biocontrols will, will kind of keep emerald ash borer populations a little bit in check. Um, so biocontrol may be an option by the time we get more infestations here in Wisconsin. Now that does wrap up my time. I see we're almost exactly at 8 o'clock. Um, so what didn't I cover? There are so many insects and diseases in the woods. Um, if I didn't cover your particular insect or disease that you were interested in, I do apologize. There are so many options that I could choose to talk about. There's a lot of life cycle information that I didn't cover here as well. So if you want any of that more specific information, by all means, contact me. Again, here's my email address and my phone number. You can contact me if you have general questions, whether, you're in, whether your county or your land is in my region or not. Um, but you can also contact the forest health specialist in your particular region. Um, so, let's see. Do I have a time for a couple of questions? Or were there any questions? I know I've covered a lot of material here. And, uh, and, and sometimes it's a little hard to <clears throat> uh, analyze it all so that you can ask questions. But if there's any questions, I'll gladly take them. All right. Well, I do have three questions here for you. Uh, as usual, I have uh, four poll questions to ask you as well. So uh, while Linda is uh, responding to the questions, um, I will send out those polls for you to answer. And those of you that are new to the session, uh, there is a GoToWebinar chat pod that popped up while you, uh, as you logged in. And there's a spot for you to ask questions. Type in your question and hit send, and uh, it comes to me, and I will share those with Linda. Um, let me just get my polls ready here. Okay, so the for, actually I have two questions. Um, one person just asked, how about oak wilt? And the second person asked, are there any new management protocols for the prevention of oak wilt migration through a stand? Ah, excellent question. Oak wilt, I can, I can have a whole hour presentation on oak wilt. Um, oak wilt is definitely still very active in Wisconsin. It does continue to spread into counties where it hasn't previously been known. Um, it can spread both underground and overground. And the second question asked about new protocols, and there are new protocols. After some recent research coming out of Minnesota showing us that the insects that can spread oak wilt over land are actually active for a longer time period than we thought previously. Um, so after we got that research, we did change the protocols just a little bit. And there is a high risk, there's what we call a high risk time period during the spring when if you're going to be harvesting in a stand with oak, we actually recommend that maybe you don't during that high risk time period. Because there's a good chance that if you're in there harvesting, or wounding the oak trees that will come, they can carry in the spores of the oak wilt fungus and they can scrape them off. So the time period uh, is a little bit longer. Now additionally, it is divided up into the north and the southern part of the state. So I would recommend, because there are some changes and because you'll have to determine whether your county is in the north or south, definitely go to the DNR Forest Health website on the left-hand side where you saw Chris click on the staff link, there will be a link called Oak Wilt. And that newest information is up there. You can find where your county is, determine whether you're in the north or the south, and you can look up those high-risk time periods. And then you can plan your harvest outside of those time periods so that you avoid uh, possibly getting Oak Wilt into your stand. I'll pop up that website again once the polls are complete so people can see it. Uh, there's a number of um, insects and diseases that are referenced on the left side of that screen, so I'll just throw that website up again in a minute. Uh, the next question is, will the mortality rates be higher for insects when winter temperatures are extreme, such as 30 below zero or colder? That's a great question. 
insect mortality does indeed increase when we have those bitter, nasty temperatures. Now, insect mortality responds to real temperatures, not wind chill. So they were temperatures. And typically, if you're going to have insect mortality, those real temperatures have to be maintained for 24 hours. Um, so this winter, yeah, we may see some insect mortality. Um, as long as those insects or the egg masses from those insects were up in the area where they're exposed to the air. They're up in the crowns of the trees um, or they're on buildings or someplace like that. If they were underneath the snow, they will be completely protected. Um, but I do expect some winter mortality because of this really great winter we've been having. So yes, indeed. Great winter is relative. <laughs> um, this is true. <laughs> <laughs> I have uh, two more questions here. And again, if anybody else has questions, feel free. Um, this one says carpenter ants. We have a lot of them some years. How do I identify the source and get rid of them? Ah, carpenter ants. Well, identifying the source can sometimes be difficult because typically the spot that they emerge is not exactly um, the nest area. The nest, there's usually like a, a little tunnel that takes them back to the nest area. Um, if you see them, you can certainly uh, kind of root them out from where they are, but be prepared to be rooting out a very large area. They tend to kind of honeycomb wood, whether they're in a tree or, or maybe in a building, and they honeycomb it upwards. And they don't always um, attack all of the wood, and so they kind of hit that center area, and they'll just move upwards quite a ways. You do need to find the queen, which will be a big, nasty-looking uh, carpenter ant. They're hardly even black. They hardly even look like an ant. You do need to find the queen and kill the queen. Um, but you can use, there are some baits now that you can put out that carpenter ants will carry back, and they'll feed to the queen, and the queen can die uh, from those baits. So try out some of the baits if, if you're having trouble in particular areas. Uh, one more, and I think this is uh, in reference to the tent caterpillar section. It says, "What kind of insect looks like a um, looks like black caterpillars, one plus inches long, and hatches inside of a tent, two to three feet in size, in a natural forest?" Um, in the spring, if if we're talking caterpillars like that, in the Spring, it probably would be eastern tent caterpillar. Um, although they don't hatch inside the tent as soon as they hatch tent around themselves. Now if it's later in the summer or even into the fall, you'll get huge webs that are on trees. They're nasty, messy looking things. And that's actually fall webworm. Now fall webworm, because of the time that it occurs in the season, late in the season, so the trees had all summer long to produce the sugars and food that it needs, then fall webworm comes along and eats the leaves off just before those leaves are ready to drop anyway. So fall webworm is generally not a major forest health problem, even though those webs can look nasty and awful. Um, so I would guess we're talking about one of those two. There are a couple of other web-making insects, uh, web-making caterpillars. Uh, for instance, there's a, a large aspen tortrix, which makes large, messy webs in aspen. Um, so. But I think it would probably be either eastern tent caterpillar or fall webworm, one of those two. A great source for identifying your insects is to uh, either bring a, a, one of them or take a picture of one of them and send it to the, one of the health, uh, forest health specialists um, that are listed on the website, which brings me back to the website, the DNR forestry website. Real quick, I had a comment from someone that said, carpenter ants only attack wet wood, so they're a good source for finding a leaky roof and wet areas in construction. <laughs> So there may be a benefit to them after all. So, uh, oh, sorry, I've got too many windows open. Uh, this is, again, the DNR um, Forest Health website. And if you look along the left side, there's forest tent caterpillar, gypsy moth, emerald ash borer, oak wilt, anosum, uh, 
and a few more in here. I, my, I have a couple windows blocking it, so I can't see it. But uh, So that's a good place to start looking. And again, if you're interested in asking a specific person a question, the staff are also listed if you click on the staff link. Uh, I don't see any more questions, so um, thank you very much, Linda, for joining us this evening and um, sharing your information with us. And as a reminder, again, in a few weeks, you will be seeing uh, an email from us with a survey. Uh, please take a few minutes to respond to that survey. Uh, we very much enjoy doing this series and uh, hope to get your feedback on how we can make it better in the future. So have a good evening. Thanks, everyone.